All right, guys, welcome back. Let's keep on rolling. <clears throat> Let's keep on rolling with our wonderful world of lungs. All right, so what if I gave you a 28-year-old woman just recently returned from, from a vacation trip, a vacation trip from Greece, which is a 10-hour flight. <laughs> 10 hour flight, just came back from the island of Mykonos. For those of you who don't know, Mykonos is a place where you shouldn't go, it's a bad place. Very bad place. 10, <laughs> 10, hour, 10 hour flight, 10 hour flight, right? And now she, go, she gets home and she's like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm short of breath, I can't breathe, I'm tachycardic, I'm gonna go to the ER. In the ER, she's found to have a heart rate of 115 beats per minute, her O2 sat's about 92%, which is a little bit low, which is a little bit low. And a smart ER doc did an ABG, which shows a low PO2, a low PAO2, a low PCO2, because she's, because she's tachypnic, right? And she has a high AA gradient. What's going on here, guys? She's got a 10 hour flight from Greece, right? Shorter breath, tachycardic, tachypnic, hypoxic with a high A gradient. Oy. Oh, did I mention she's also on birth control pills? She's also on oral contraceptives? Of course she is. She went on a vacation trip to Mykonos. She better be on birth control pills. <laughs> she's on oral contraceptives? Did I mention that? Mm. So, what are you worried about here, boys and girls, ladies and gents? What are you worried about? Pulmonary embolus, right? P E, P E, P E. Dio mio, pulmonary embolus, P-E, P-E, P-E. And a P-E, a pulmonary embolus, is one of the banes of your medical doctor's existence. And it's a bane of our existence because mortality, is dramatic mortality, the mortality of a P-E increases with each segment. So in other words, subsegmental mortality is about 8 to 12%, a small portion of the, of the lobe, of the lung. And if you go to segmental, it goes up by about another 8 to 10. For every segment of size, it goes up by 8 to 10%. Of course, you reach a saddle embolus, which is the entire right lung, and the mortality is like, what, 85%? It's like dead. Okay. So, but the problem is, despite the mortality rate, peace sometimes can be very hard to find. I'll give you an example. We recently had a mortality right now when I was, when I was on service at the hospital. Post-op patient. Coded and died two, day two post-op. Day two, and the CT angiogram is negative. We'll talk about the tests in a minute. The CT angiogram is negative. Autopsy revealed whopping large bilateral PEs. Wow. You, you see what I'm saying? So PEs can be sometimes they can hide, and it's very there could be very 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 insidious. You have to be very careful. So when you're addressing a possible PE like in this case, the way you have to address it is pre-test probability. The testing you have to do first, you have to think of it right. What I always tell the residents and the students and the fellows, my fellows, if you don't think it, you won't test for it. If you don't test for it, you won't find it. You have to think of it first. Once you think of it, say, oh shit, it may, be, it may be a PE. Now what are you gonna do? Then you say, okay, which test is gonna fit me, right? But to think of a PE, that means the patient risk. So pre-test probability is the statistical term, patient risk is the clinical term, they're the same thing. So what are the, or what are, Patient risk factors. What are patient risk factors? Increasing pretest probability or patient risk. It includes immobility, right? Stagnant blood likes to clot. What else? Malignancy. Cancerous blood likes to clot. What else? Anything involving estrogen. I've said it like 17 times. Oral contraceptives, estrogens, oral contraceptives, HRT, hormonal replacement therapy, CIRMs like in osteoporosis, tamoxifen or loxifen, all of them. What else? Immobility, malignancy, estrogen. How about orthopedic procedures? Specifically knees and hips, boy. Knees is the worst. Knees is the worst. But knees and hips, boy. Definitely. No question about it, right? These are your risk factors. She has a great clinical story, doesn't she? Good clinical story, right? So, now, you have multiple tests to choose from. My God, when do I do a CT angiogram? What about a lower extremity Doppler? Wait, isn't there a VQ scan thing? Oh, wait, I forgot about the D-dimer. 
What did it do what? Well, I'm going to break it down. We're going to kiss it. Keep it simple, stupid. We're going to kiss it and break it down for you. First things first. The test of choice today, the test of choice today is a CT angiogram. Hands down, bar none. Every major pulmonary and thoracic society approves it. CT angiogram is the test of choice to rule out or rule in both a PE. The problem is a lot of the tests that rule in a PE don't rule it out. A lot of tests that rule it out don't rule it in. CT angiogram is, one, is, one, is the best one clinically, non-invasive, pretty good specificity and sensitivity, both. The gold, the quote unquote, and I hate the word gold standard, but the quote unquote gold standard is still the pulmonary angiogram. However, it's not real. It's not real. And I'll t what do you mean by, by it's not real? To do a pulmonary angiogram is fairly invasive. You take a needle, you put it into someone's pulmonary circulation, and you inject dye. A pulmonary angiogram carries a 1% chance of critical and lethal pulmonary hypertension. It also carries about a 20% chance of causing acute renal failure. What do you think about that? And would you like a needle in your pulmonary artery? No. It's very invasive and it's a high risk. I'm doing practicing medicine guys over 10 years. I've, I've only seen it done one time when I was a third year medical student, which is more than 10 years ago. Okay, this is not done. The risk is too high. It's considered the gold standard because an angiogram gets a perfect picture of the arteries. That's true, but the risk is way too high. A CT angio is the test of choice. That's the easy part. So in someone like her, in someone like her, there's no question about it. She would get a CT angiogram. I mean, it's not even a question. It's not even a question. Not even a question. The tricksy part comes. Let me tell you where it gets tricksy. Tricksy, tricksy little hobbits is. This is where it gets tricksy. The tricksy part comes. What if I told you her creatinine is 1.6? What if I told you that? Now you can't use the dye in the CT, in the CT angiogram, right? So if for some reason you cannot use the CT angiogram, that's when you have complications. And that's when you have to use some of the other tests. So let's take a look at them. How about a VQ scan? A ventilatory to perfusion scan. A VQ scan, ventilation to perfusion scan. Comparing the ventilation of a pulmonary segment to the perfusion of a pulmonary segment. How about that? Are they good? Sure. Their positive predictive value is pretty good. If they are positive, if they are positive, in a high risk or intermediate risk patient with a good pretest probability, it's positive. However, their negative predictive value, caca. Caca, negative predictive value. And the bigger issue is with them, the biggest, the bigger issue with the, with the uh, VQ scans is, the pulmonary, uh, the ventilation, ventilation perfusion scans is, they're, they very often come back intermediate. <laughs> the radiologist can't put a stamp on it, right? They very often come back intermediate. That's why, that's why VQ scans are a problem. If you cannot use a CT angiogram, then you could use this. But they're not, they're not entirely accurate. There's ways that you could improve its specificity and sensitivity. Let's take a look. What about a lower extremity Doppler? Lower extremity duplex. So, tell me, where do 98%, 98%, 98 of all PEs come from? Lower extremity. Lower extremity and pelvis. From the pelvis to the lower extremity. That's where they come from. The other 2% are unknown. It's not upper extremity. Upper extremity thrombosis cannot embolize to the lungs anatomically. Lower extremity. They, all, they almost all come from the lower, from lower extremity, guys. Therefore, if you have a good clinical story, a good pretest probability, like her, right? And you have a positive Doppler for DVT, a deep vein thrombosis of the lower extremity of your pelvis. Does she have a PE? Yes. So what Dopplers do is Dopplers rule in hot, with a good pretest probability. They rule in. Where's their problem? Same case, this, this, this young lady right here. You do a Doppler on her, comes back negative. Does she not have a PE? You can't say that. So their negative predictive value is pretty bad. So you cannot use to rule out, does not rule out. Clear? It rules in. So Dopplers rule in when you have a good pretest probability. I'll say it again. Dopplers rule a PE in 
if you have a good pretest probability because they have a clinical story and they have clots in their legs. And all PEs come from the clots in the legs, as far as you're concerned. And you could add it to a VQ scan to increase sensitivity and specificity. So if they give you, for example, an intermediate, it's like a 10% question. If they give you an intermediate on a VQ scan and they ask you what to do, because you couldn't you do a CT angio, and they ask you what to do next, and the lower extremity Doppler is there, that's the answer. That's what they want. Because you know, they want you to increase specificity and sensitivity. Now what I often, what drives me bat crazy, crazy, is my friends in the ER send this on everybody. D-dimer. What is a D-dimer? A D-dimer is a product of clot degradation, right? Very good. So the, pre the premise is, if the D-dimer is elevated, that means the person has a clot going on, right? Wrong. The problem is that D-dimer is also an acute phase reactant. It rises with anything. So a positive D-dimer, a positive one, put it in red. A positive one equals caca. <laughs> I'm going to write caca here. Caca. It's useless. Absolutely useless. Look at me. Useless. And it drives me crazy because everyone sends it. However, however, let's say you have a 20-year-old kid coming to the ER, cough, short of breath because he's a little bit of bronchitis. Or a mild case of a cold or something like that. For some reason you want to rule out a PE. And you send a D-dimer on this kid. And it's negative. Did you rule out a PE in the kid? You did. So where D-dimers, if a D-dimer is negative, that means that's good. That means there is no clot going on in that person's body whatsoever. So if you have a negative D-dimer plus a low pretest probability, low patient risk, you're good. So in essence, a D-dimer rules out in a low risk patient. So D-dimer rules out a PE in a low risk patient. A lower extremity Doppler rules in a PE in a high risk patient. A VQ scan is a watered down version of a CT angiogram. And if you combine it with a Doppler, it improves specificity and sensitivity. CT angio, test of choice. We broke down the test. You see that? Boom. Now, you do a CT angiogram on her, it comes back positive. For the record though, if this lady's in, the e in my ER right now, if I'm on service, if I'm there, I'm not going to wait for the CT angiogram to come back. I'm going to treat her right away. And how are we going to treat this? Well, of course you're going to treat with what? Anticoagulation, right? You're going, to you're going to lock her out. Anticoagulation. And so, in the acute phase, in the inpatient phase, you're going to treat with what? Heparin. Whether you go low molecular weight heparin, like enoxaparin, or you go unfractionate, traditional heparin, unfractionate heparin. It doesn't matter. Low molecular weight heparin is a little better in regards to logistics, but the fact is the clinical effect is the same. That's how you're going to treat her right away in the acute phase, right? Boom, done, end of story. What about long term? And we talked about this also during a little bit during rheumatology, during antiphospholipid syndrome. Long term, okay, so if she has an event like this, with no risk factors, primarily antiphospholipid syndrome and factor V laden. Antiphospholipid syndrome and factor V laden. If she has a DVT PE, no risk factors, six months of anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation, such as rivaroxaban, rivaroxaban, such as apixaban, apixaban. These are all direct thrombin inhibitors, right? Such as dabigatrin, factor V inhibitor, right? And of course, traditional warfarin is still there. Traditional warfarin is still there, but of course, you have to follow an INR and keep the INR between 2 and 2.5. On 2. Okay? If she does have an event like this, and she has a risk factor, let's say she has antiphospholipid syndrome, she has an event and a positive risk factor. And she has an event like this. Lifelong. She is not having a second on me. Mm -mm. Hell no. Hell no. Not on me, not on my watch. 
lifelong. Okay? End of story. A couple special circumstances. What if situation like this and she has a positive DVT and she has a positive DVT, positive DVT, however, she has a history of GI bleeds and you cannot anticoagulate, so therefore you cannot what? Anticoagulate. What do you do? That's when you would do an intravenous, an inferior venicavo filter. That's when you would do a filter. If you cannot anticoagulate, if you cannot anticoagulate, that's when you would use a filter. That's when you would use a filter. All right? Only if you cannot anticoagulate and she has an existing DVT. You're not going to do anything about the clot that's already there. What you're doing is preventing the next one from breaking off and, from, and catching it. Okay? That's the point of a filter. What if she's pregnant? Ooh. What if she's pregnant? If she's a pregnosaurus? What if she's pregnant? What can you use? Heparin. No, please do not use warfarin, for God's sakes, please. Any heparin is good in pre a traditional, low a traditional unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. It's not perfectly fine. We use heparin. If she develops, and by the way, pregnancy is a risk factor for DVTs and PEs. We all know that. Heparin. Low molecular weight or unfractionated traditional heparin. Either one. But please, no warfarin. Please, no warfarin. Please, please, please. What if she's showing signs? This is a special circuit. Showing signs of right ventricular strain and hypotension. What must you do? She's earned what? Thrombolysis. She's earned thrombolysis with TPA because this is a sign of imminent failure and she's going to die. She's going to die. Now, what are the signs of RV strain? What are the signs of RV strain? Peak P waves and the peak P, P waves in the in the inferior leads, right? Two, three, and AVF. Peak P waves in the inferior leads. Right axis deviation. But I gotta tell you, the whole Q3, T3 nonsense, it's all nonsense. That's you never see that on EKG and a PE. It's in some book somewhere. You never see it. The most common EKG finding is nothing or, or sinus tachycardia. That's it. With some unspecific ST changes. That's it. That's all you're going to see in EKG. But if you see signs of an RV pattern, plus she's hypotensive, cardiovascular instability, then you're going to do an echocardiogram. Then you do an echo, right? And on the echo, you see RV, RV strain. You better, you better lice her. You better th send TPA. Start TPA right away. Systemic TPA to lice her. All right? Very important. High mortality, guys. You don't want to miss it. All right, ladies and gents, DVT testing, palm emboli. Know it. Don't, no matter what specialty you do, you will see this. All right, guys. See you later.